Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank We're just going to whisper up here for a no. while. <laughs> We've known each other a long time. <laughs> From the old country. Um, two long married people are walking on a beach. Oh, this is a joke. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> a Jew and a... No. And... <laughs> And they're walking on a beach, and they're discussing what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. And she sort of seems a little bit more interested in the world, and he seems maybe a little bit more interested in resting. And out of the sea walk two human-sized lizards and uh, walk over to them. And the husband looks and says, Terrifying. And the wife says, yes, beautiful. I never saw Seascape when it was on Broadway for its brief time, relatively brief time, in 1975. Four and a half months. OK, that's not so brief. Um, and, but I did see it in 1977 in Chicago when I was a critic at the Chicago Tribune and a regional production. And that was the only time that I had ever seen this play. But I can't tell you how many times I have gone back to that exchange. Terrifying. Yes, beautiful. And I think it's because that's the way I feel about his work. Um, that, that there is that sense of true emotional terrorism. And yet the beauty of the language, the beauty of the understanding of the futility of worrying about mortality. Um, he's very good with the abyss, which is a favorite subject of mine. Anyway, um, I have not seen Seascape. They don't allow the press in until next week. But I'd love to ask you a little bit about the genesis of Seascape. Okay. I was going to tell a joke, too. Okay. All right. I was going to tell a real joke. Yeah. I was on the subway a couple of weeks ago, and uh, some guy was passing out the, uh, the, the, uh, the homeless person's newspaper, and uh, I bought a copy for a buck, and, you know, I didn't think I was going to bother to look at it, but then there was a whole page of jokes uh, about um, Bush. <laughs> And I will just share one of them with you because I thought it was, it had to do with theater. That's, that, that's why I'm going to share it with you. Uh, Bush is having uh, a dream, worried about a number of things, as he might well be. Um, in the White House, like, what am I doing here? How did I get here? <laughs> and uh, the ghost of Abraham Lincoln appears in front of him. And Bush says, oh, Mr. President, you, you did so much, and, and, and you did it so, so beautifully with, with the war and, and everything. Uh, help me. Tell me the one thing that I can do that will make the most difference. And Abraham Lincoln thought for a moment and said, go see a play. <laughs> And you got that for a buck. I got that for a buck, yeah. Now, you want to know about the genesis of Seascape? Oh, yeah, why not? Well, why, let's, start, let's start there. It was your second Pulitzer Prize. Yes, I guess it did. Yes? Uh, second and a half. Yes, well, we'll, we'll do that. We'll get to that. Uh, I, I have to say first that I am not a didactic, consciously didactic playwright. I don't decide now it's time to write about this or that subject and then try to find characters and, and, and a situation that will, that will address my concerns. I don't do that. I think I do that unconsciously. Because to be really truthful, I write my plays down on paper to find out why I'm writing them, to find out what has motivated the plays to, uh, to come into my mind. And after the fact, 
then I can make relatively intelligent guesses ab about what motivated the play. Now, this play Seascape with two human beings and uh, two uh, lizards, lizard creatures, come up as part of the evolutionary process, uh, I think probably was motivated by the fact that I keep my eyes and ears open and I was beginning to wonder, are we really evolving? Are human beings that much further ahead from other creatures? Maybe we're devolving. They, 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 they don't have so many of the things that, uh, 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 that, that we have. Uh, they don't have hatred. They, 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 they don't have all sorts of terrible things that seem to mo motivate us so nicely. And I think the play probably got written to analyze whether or not humans indeed are ahead of the game and, and maybe have lost so much through evolving that they're not as fortunate as so-called lesser creatures. I have to tell something else that's funny. Go. This is nice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I go to Eastern Europe a lot. I went up to Eastern Europe a great deal during the bad times when the Soviet Union was running rampant all over Eastern Europe. And I was in Prague, Czechoslovakia, uh, during the Soviet occupation in about 68, 70. And they were doing the production of this play, Seascape, in Václav Havel's own theater, the Balustrade Theater. He was not allowed to go into that theater anymore. But I got him in. But that's <laughs> they were doing a production of my play Seascape, and I thought it was not a bad production. It was, it was sort of okay. Two lizards, uh, two human beings, everybody speaking Czech. <laughs> and the uh, director took me aside afterwards and said, you don't speak Czech, do you? I said, no. He said, well, I want to tell you we did something very interesting uh, in, in this production of your play Seascape. We had the human beings speaking perfect Czech, and we had the lizards speaking Czech with a Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that made me happy. <laughs> that made me very happy, because it, it was a political statement. But was it backwards? Hmm? If, if indeed the lizards are perhaps more evolved, then would they be speaking with a Russian accent? No, not that, not that they're more evolved, but that evolution seems to be perhaps doing things uh -huh. that give the impression of, 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 of de-evolution. De okay. Anyway, what they were doing is they were making terrible fun of the Russians, and, and that was nice. It's nice when a play can do something useful politically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you liked these lizards. I, I like them. Lizards. I think they're very nice. But oh. they, they were useful to the Czechs. Okay. Okay. Uh, in Eastern Europe. Sorry, Euro I told the joke. <laughs> <laughs> he apologized to me. Um, okay. In Eastern Europe, uh, do they really call it "Who's Afraid of Franz Kafka"? Uh, in, in in Czechoslovakia, yes, they call it "Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf"? "Who's Afraid of Franz Kafka"? Yes. <laughs> and what do they sing? I I, I don't really know because uh, I don't speak Czech and I can't talk <laughs> uh, to these people about, about that. Did you know that Kafka in Prague lived in a weird little apartment? They built an apartment building in front of the cathedral in Wenceslas Square. And Kafka had an apartment that looked in on the cathedral and out onto the street. And was it Kafkaesque then? Well, that might have been Kafkaesque. I don't know. In fact, you are a very political person. Well, I would hope so. Uh, yeah, I would hope so. But, but, um, but you aren't making public statements the way, for example, Harold Pinter is, and and what I guess Arthur Miller was doing too. That you're you're very political. And I know that from knowing you a little bit, and certainly anybody who... I was just thinking about uh, a time a number of years ago, 25 years ago, when Arthur and I were both uh, marching in front of the Soviet uh, okay. mission to the United Nations. Okay. Uh, I was just the other evening I was uh, speaking at um, Cooper Union with uh, Salman Rushdie and, and, and 14 other writers. 
I take that all back. Uh, commenting on, on, on the imprisonment and, and torture and, and, and murder of, of, of writers. And I was talking, reminding people of what had happened to Federico Garcia Lorca uh, during the, uh, uh, the, the, the fascist take takeover of Spain. I belong for 35 years to the Freedom to Write Committee of Penn. I can't go anywhere okay. these days, especially considering how awful things are in this country, uh, without, without shooting my mouth off politically at was, universities. Yeah, yeah. well, so, I know that. Uh, yeah, I, I make noise occasionally. And yet, really, none of, except for the death of Bessie Smith. Oh, you're talking about whether the plays are Well, now are I am. Well, okay. Now I am. Now, I'm trying to save myself here. The death of Bessie, <laughs> the death, the death of Bessie Smith is, is the most overtly political yeah. play yeah. that I've written. But Which I was very early. Uh, well, for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but I do think that, that all my plays are political. Yes. In the sense that I think that they hold a mirror up to people and say, look, this is the way you behave. Uh, this is how you are. If you don't like it, why don't you change? Because I, I'm convinced the way people think about their own participation in their own lives determines ultimately how they will vote. And I keep hoping that if people spend more time involving themselves in what it's like to be conscious and what it's like to be alive, they'll all be Democrats. <laughs> Is it? I think probably if F. Scott Fitzgerald were alive, even he would be tired of this quote by now that there are no second acts in American life. There are no third acts in American plays anymore, have you noticed that? Wow. <laughs> for, for, for which we are grateful. Oh, I don't know. Uh, it depends if you've got I a like, date you I want like, to talk I to. I like the three you act You like a three act play, all right. Sure. Okay. Um, and there was a while there when people were thinking that you weren't around anymore. Um, of course, you were around. You were at regional theaters, and you were in Europe, and you were being produced, and you were writing plays and, and having them produced uh, just about everywhere but New York. Yeah, stuff happens, you know. I was going along very nicely there. I had the four short plays that um, uh, uh, Death's Bessie Smith, The American Dream, Sandbox, Zoo, Zoo Story, Story. They were doing very well. Then Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf came along, which was just as long as the other four put together. <laughs> and uh, then everybody said, wow. This is great. Good playwright. And they waited for me to write Son of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, or Virginia Woolf II. And I didn't do it. I wrote Tiny Alice, <laughs> and, uh, which is sort of a very simple, straightforward metaphysical melodrama. This, this puzzled them. Maybe, maybe he'll write uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf II or Son of Virginia Woolf next. But I didn't do that. And so I was disappointing a lot of people who thought that they knew better than I what I should be writing. You think that's what's happening? I think that's basically what happened. Yeah. Happens to a lot of writers. Yeah. You know. I remember uh, with Tennessee Williams, uh, um, he was getting some, after maybe about eight or ten plays in, he was getting some not very great reviews. And, and they said, why doesn't he uh, do something new? He's repeating himself. The exact opposite. He's doing all the same stuff all over again. Why doesn't he do something new? So Tennessee listened a little bit too much, and he wrote Camino Real, a very, very different play. And the critical response, almost to a critic, was, why doesn't he stick to what he knows? <laughs> sure. Uh, but you learn quick enough in the theater, and, and you learn you've got you to live with this. Sometimes you're going to be in fashion. Sometimes you're not. And it doesn't necessarily have very much to do with how well you're writing. Mm 